thing acted. He moved back to Indiana pretty soon, went to Wellsville. Wellsville was the place the Hagedorns was from. Mighty fine family. Old Maryland stock. Old Squire Hagedorn could carry around more mixed liquor and cuss better than most any man I ever see. His second wife was the Witter Billings. She that was Becky Martin. Her dam was Deacon Dunlap's first wife. Her oldest child, Maria, married a missionary and died in grace. Et up by the savages. They et him, too, poor feller. Biled him. It weren't the custom, so they say, but they explained to friends of his and that went down there to bring away his things that they'd tried missionaries every other way and never could get any good out of them. And so it annoyed all his relations to find out that the, that man's life was fooled away just out of a derned experiment, so to speak. But mind you, there ain't anything ever really lost. Everything that people can't understand and don't see the reason of does good if you only hold on and give it a fair shake. Providence don't fire no blank cartridges, boys. That there missionary substance, unbeknownst to himself, actually converted every last one of them heathens that took a chance at the barbecue. Nothing ever fetched them but that. Don't tell me it was an accident that he was biled. There ain't no such thing as an accident. When my Uncle Lem was leaning up again a scaffolding once, sick or drunk or southern, an Irishman with a hod full of bricks fell on him out of the third story and broke the old man's back in two places. People said it was an accident. Much accident there was about that. He didn't know what he was there for, but he was there for a good object. If he hadn't been there, the Irishman would have been killed. Nobody can ever make me believe anything different from that. Uncle Lem's dog was there. Why didn't the Irishman fall on the dog? Because the dog would have seen him a coming and stood from under. That's the reason the dog weren't a pinted, a pinted. A dog can't be depended on to carry out a special providence. Mark my words, it was a put-up thing. Accidents don't happen, boys. Uncle Lem's dog. I wish you could have seen that dog. He was a regular shepherd, or rather, he was part bull and part shepherd. A splendid animal. Belonged to Parson Hagger before Uncle Lem got him. Parson Hagger belonged to the Western Reserve Haggers, prime family. His mother was a Watson. One of his sisters married a Wheeler. They settled in Morgan County, and he got nipped by the machinery in a carpet factory and went through a less than a quarter of, went through in less than a quarter of a minute. His widder bought a piece of carpet that had his remains woven in, and people came a hundred mile to ten miles to attend the funeral. There was fourteen yards in the piece. She wouldn't let them roll him up, but planted him just so, full length. The church was middling small where they preached <coughs> the funeral and they had to let one end of the coffin stick out of the window. They didn't bury him. They planted one end and let him stand up same as a monument. And they nailed a sign on it and put put on put on it sacred to the memory of 14 yards of three ply carpet containing all that was mortal of of William Way. Jim Blaine had been growing gradually drowsy and drowsier. His head nodded once, twice, three times, dropped peacefully upon his breast, and he fell tranquilly asleep. The tears were running down the boys' cheeks. They were suffocating with suppressed laughter, and had been from the start, though I have never noticed it. I perceived that I was sold. I learned then that Jim Blaine's peculiarity was that whenever he reached a certain stage of intoxication, no human power could keep him from setting out with impressive unction to tell about a wonderful adventure which he had once had with his grandfather's old ram and the mention of the ram in the first sentence was as far as any man had ever heard him get concerning it. He always maundered off interminably from one thing to another till his whiskey got the best of him and he fell asleep. 
when the thing was that what the thing was that happened to him in his grandfather's old ram is a dark mystery to this day for nobody has ever yet found out chapter 54 chinese in virginia city washing bills habit of imitation chinese immigration a visit to chinatown Monsieur Zha Sing, Hong Wo, Si Ya, etc. Of course, there was a large Chinese population in Virginia. It is the case with every town and city on the Pacific coast. They are a harmless race when white men either let them alone or treat them no worse than dogs. In fact, they are almost entirely harmless anyhow, for they seldom think of resenting the vilest insults or the cruelest injuries. They are quiet, peaceable, tractable, free from drunkenness, and they are as industrious as the day is long. A disorderly Chinaman is rare, and a lazy one does not exist. So long as a Chinaman has strength to use his hands, he needs no support from anybody. White men often complain of want of work, but a Chinaman offers no such complaint. He always manages to find something to do. He is a great convenience to everybody even to the worst class of white men, for he bears the most of their sins, suffering fines for their petty thefts, imprisonment for their robberies, and death for their murders. Any white man can swear a Chinaman's life away in the courts, but no Chinaman can testify against a white man. Ours is the land of the free. Nobody denies that. Nobody challenges it. Maybe it is because we won't let other people testify. As I write, news comes that in broad daylight in San Francisco, some boys have stoned an inoffensive Chinaman to death, and that although a large crowd witnessed the shameful deed, no one interfered. There are 70,000, and possibly 100,000, Chinamen on the Pacific coast. There were about a thousand in Virginia. They were penned into a Chinese quarter, a thing which they do not particularly object to, as they are fond of herding together. Their buildings were of wood, usually only one story high, and set thickly together along streets, scarcely wide enough for a wagon to pass through. Their quarter was a little removed from the rest of the town. The chief employment of Chinamen in towns is to wash clothing. They always send a bill, like this below, pinned to the clothes. It is mere ceremony, for it does not enlighten the customer much. Their price for washing was $2.50 per dozen, rather cheaper than white people could afford to wash for at that time. A very common sign on the Chinese houses was, See Yup, washer and ironer. Hong Wo, washer. Sam Sing and, and Ah Hop, washing. The house servants, cooks, etc. in California and Nevada were chiefly Chinamen. There were few white servants and no China woman so employed. China men make good house servants, being quick, obedient, patient, quick to learn, and tirelessly industrious. They do not need to be taught a thing twice, as a general thing. They are imitative. If a Chinaman were to see his master break up a center table in a passion and kindle a fire with it, that Chinaman would be likely to resort to the furniture for fuel forever afterward. All Chinamen can read, write, and cipher with easy facility. Pity, but all our petted voters could. In California, they rent little patches of ground and do a deal of gardening. They will raise surprising crops of vegetables on a sand pile. They waste nothing. What is rubbish to a Christian, a Chinaman carefully preserves and makes useful in one way or another. He gathers up all the old oyster and sardine cans that white men people throw away and procures marketable tin and solder from them by melting. He gathers up old bones and turns them into manure. In California, he gets a living out of old mining claims that white men have abandoned as exhausted and worthless. And then the officers come down on him once a month with an exorbitant swindle to which the legislature has given the broad general name of foreign mining tax, but it is usually inflicted on no foreigners but Chinamen. 
This swindle has, in some cases, been repeated once or twice on the same victim in the course of the same month, but the public treasury was not additionally enriched by it, probably. probably. Chinamen hold their dead in great reverence. They worship their departed ancestors, in fact. Hence, in China, a man's front yard, backyard, or any other part of his premises is made his family burying ground in order that he may visit the graves at any and all times. Therefore, that huge empire is one mighty cemetery. It is ridged and, and wrinkled from its center to its circumference with graves, and inasmuch as every foot of ground